My name is John Wiley and I'm the President of the Library Board of Victoria and uh, I'm absolutely rapt to be here in the great domed room of, of the State Library of Victoria, the, the La Trobe Reading Room, to be uh, reading from Oscar and Lucinda by Peter Carey here today. And it's a very special day because this is in fact the 100th anniversary of the, of the domed room here at the, at the uh, State Library today. So I'll try and do the occasion justice by giving it a nice reading. I'm going to read uh, chapter 105 of Oscar and Lucinda. There's a particular reason I've chosen this book in that uh, I loved this book when I first read it. I read it uh, in, in a non-stop effort um, on a flight from New York to London back in 1988. And um, when uh, Peter Carey recently came into the library, uh, I brought this book in to um, try and get the great man's autograph. And I presented him with the book and uh, like a very good author who's always, always got a, a twist in his uh, plot, he, uh, he, he asked me about the missing chapter. And of course I didn't know about the missing chapter. There was a missing chapter in the original American version that I, that I bought. And uh, so all this time, the uh, 110 or so chapters of Oscar and Lucinda, I was oblivious to the fact that um, I was in fact, I'd never read the third last chapter. So, uh, and I've got a little autograph from Peter, um, who's a kindly inscribed book, so much appreciated Peter. Chapter 105. The Isle of a Cathedral. The Bellinger was not like it is now, with wide electric green fields pushing down to on, onto the river. The banks were like green cliffs of camoufla camouflage, pierced with giant knitting needles and spun and tangled all about with ferns and creepers. It was a landscape already bleeding from the stabbing and hacking of the cedar cutters, but the wounds were all internal, in the belly of the bush, and although Oscar saw how Percy Smith and his two helpers must jump and poke with their punting poles to keep them clear of, of floating cedar logs, he did not guess the history of these logs. He saw only the shrieking walls of jungle, which threw up wide-winged birds as the church approached. Lord and no, he was not at ease. He called for Percy Smith to lock the door. He placed his hard wooden chair in the very middle of the church. He prayed out loud, and his voice had a hard, vibrant quality inside the glass. He said, O Lord, I am alive in the midst of thy dreadful river. All thy glory surrounds me, but I am afraid. Outside the walls, he could hear the man named Rumgo giggling. This had no more importance to him than the cries of savage birds. My great-grandfather drifted up the Bellinger River like a blind man up the central isle of Notre Dame. He saw nothing. The country was thick with sacred stories more ancient than the ones he carried in, the, in his sweat-slippery leather Bible. He did not even imagine their presence. Some of these stories were as small as the transparent anthropods that lived in the puddles beneath the river Casuarinas. These stories were like fleas, thrip, so tiny that they might inhabit a place inside the ears of the seeds of grass he would later walk across without even seeing. In this landscape, every rock had a name, and most names had spirits, ghosts, meanings. He had given his hat to Kurumbani Giri, Billy's father's sister. It was the Wednesday before Good Friday. And although it was now cool in Sydney, it was hot at this latitude. Under the canopy of glass, it was very hot indeed. Only on the dogleg bend at Fernmount was the riverbank able to provide any shade. Kumbangari Gili, Biri, Billy, saw the glass church. He was a young boy, initiated only the year before. He was with the men hunting at the place which is now named Mark's Hill. He saw the glass church in the distance, a prism, a cube, a steeple of, sli of light sliding into the green shadows of Fern Mount. There were men with blue shirts and wide brimmed hats. They held long poles. They stood around the perimeter. In the middle was a man. Even in the shadow, so Kumbangari Billy told my father, fire danced around this man's head. 